Okay, uh, three things. Some of you are, have your email boxes full already. Please, we do not want to have things bounce back. We, con we communicate with you through email, so clean out your inboxes. Second, um, there has been a change to the syllabus, specifically as to how much gets contributed to your participation grades as opposed to the exams, so you should check that out. Um, and third, tonight I'm going to post the first question, or probably tomorrow morning, on the discussion boards, uh, and it's going to relate to this notion that was in the Hollywood Reporter yesterday. Is it time for Yahoo to Hulu? So it's a question of should Yahoo, which is having some problems, buy part or all of Hulu? And I'd love as many of you who feel up to it to jump in and think about it. Okay, so um, today we're, we're going to talk about this concept of the interregnum that I mentioned briefly last time. And the interregnum comes from this notion that you get in a place in which the old is dying, but the new cannot be born. So we all know that the Hummer is literally dying, you know, and that way of life associated with the Hummer is dying, but not everybody has embraced the Prius way of life yet. Uh, we all know that you know, we're, we're kind of pissed off at bankers for making hundreds of billions of dollars in bonuses, but the pissed offness, the anger goes in weird ways and sometimes it goes in these kind of tea party ways. And so there's a, a general confusion in the air. But I would argue that this, the idea of the interregnum is this point that we're we have an old story and we have a new story and we're caught somewhere in between. And, and you know, just taking things like religion, well the old story was dominion. So man had dominion over the earth. He could do whatever he wanted to do with it. And the new story is this notion of stewardship, that you have to take care of the earth and, and that's part of the deal. In the military, the old story was hard power and now the new story is soft power. If you go and listen to General Petraeus, he says a lot of the work that has to be taken in Afghanistan is winning hearts and minds, and that won't be done with uh, guns. Technology, obviously the old story was an analog world, and the new story is a digital world, and yes, we've gone all the way over, but there's, as we will see over the course of the year, there are some problems with that. Organizational. The old story was top down. There was a, the company was a pyramid. There was a few people at the top that ruled everything and there was a bunch of people at the bottom who had no power whatsoever except to do what they were supposed to do. And the new story is bottom up. That is the companies that really lead allow people at the bottom to bring forth innovations and make things happen. In energy, the old story was a centralized hydrocarbon economy based on oil and coal, and the new story is a very distributed energy technology economy, which might mean that you have a solar panel on your roof, and you might even be selling some energy back to the city. In other words, your electric meter might be going backwards. In politics, the old story was a notion of centralized power in Washington, and the new story is one that I've been pushing for about two or three years, which is called new federalism, which means that power must be distributed to the edge and that the local school board should be able to figure out what works for that district, not be told by the central government. In trade, the old story was free trade, like everybody's going to be fine and it all is going to work and now we realize maybe that doesn't work and so the new story is the notion of fair trade, 
which means that maybe people can't steal our intellectual property, and there's all sorts of issues about that which we'll get into later. In capital, the old story was use debt. Everyone used their house and the home equity as an ATM, and that doesn't work anymore, and now the new story is equity. That means you've got to have some skin in the game, and that has to do with the way companies are capitalized and the way your personal life is capitalized. And in media, the old story was big centralized studios, and the new story is user-generated content coming from everybody. So, what we're going to do is think about this interregnum, and as I said to you before, is started, this idea started really around the foundation of the American country and the American ideal. And it was a very radical notion. It was both a political movement and a spiritual movement. And it was started by a bunch of Quakers and a bunch of kind of Puritan radical thinkers that fled England and fled the English Civil War to come to the United States in pursuit of a religious freedom. And as the diggers, who were the most radical of these religious sects, said in 1649, all is one man working together and feeding together as sons of the father, members of the family, not one lording over another, but all looking upon each other as equals in the creation. This at a point when the English king was deemed to be ordained by God was a very radical notion. Remember, England had an aristocracy and the king at the top, so no one lording it over another was a pretty radical notion. And so a lot of people left England and came to America, and this is John Winthrop, who was the man who was at the center of this immigration from England to America, who led the first colonies of pilgrims to the United States. And he said himself in a very famous speech, said, we shall be as the city on the hill, the eyes of the world will be upon us, we must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluities for the supply of others' necessities. Again, a very commutarian notion of how we will all work together to make a better country. And this notion of the, that America was a city on a hill, this very unique place, is really critical to the whole idea of the American ideal. So, the revolution founded by Thomas Jefferson in his Declaration of Independence, and then George, Will, uh, George Washington as the, our first president, is based on two ideas. And that is, first, this liberal idea, which is we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, they, they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So this is, despite whatever you've heard from Glenn Beck, is the American basis. And it is a liberal idea, meaning the word liberty, coming from John Locke, who was the English philosopher that founded the philosophy. And the idea is that there's a certain notion of equality of opportunity. And then there is a notion that liberty is critical. The second notion was that we would be different from other countries, that we would not engage in the world of empire, and as Washington said in his final speech, it will be our policy to cultivate tranquility at home and abroad and extend our commerce as far as possible. In other words, the American ideal was not to become an imperial power, but simply to become a trading power. We would have commerce with everyone. So you have this sense of individual responsibility which is coupled with this deep, constant injunction for altruism. That we're all gonna work together, but we've also got individual responsibilities to make ourselves better. Now, 
The problem was, and the problem still exists, that America had a hard time keeping these promises. And as the famous historian Joseph Ellis said, the main story of American history cast Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton in the lead roles of a dramatic contest between the forces of democracy and the forces of aristocracy. So Jefferson represented the forces of true democracy based on his Declaration of Independence, and Hamilton represented the forces of his New York City constituents, which were the bankers. They were the bondholders, and they wanted a very strong central government, and they wanted the government to buy up all the bonds of the various states, and Hamilton's friends, Hamilton won out, and his friends made a lot of money. So you have this tension between these forces of democracy and these forces of money power, which sit at the root of the American problem to this very day. Now, capital, the notion of capitalism, comes from a very basic philosophy, and I'm sure you've encountered Adam Smith in your studies. And Smith said a basic thing, which is, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. So what was Smith saying? He was saying that basically the reason capitalism works is that we will all look out for our own interest, but in the battle between all these interests, it will work out okay. So if you're a butcher or a baker, you're just trying to make as much money as you can. And at some point, the market will tell you whether you're charging too much for your bread or your beer, and, and that will work itself out. So the basis of this is specialization. You pick something that you specialize in, and then you trade with other people. You make the bread, you make the beer, we'll all be happy, right? Now, this has led to two warring views about the American experience, one of which you may have encountered which are the views of Ayn Rand, which I strongly disagree with. And her thesis was, do not talk to me of altruism. I don't want to hear about it. The only thing matters is that you look out for yourself and you pursue with all your energy, your selfish desires, and everything will work out. So this is Adam Smith on steroids. The other thesis, of which Axelrod is only one of the many people putting forth, is that in the history of evolution, societies that learned how to cooperate did better than societies that didn't know how to cooperate. So if you were in a group, in a little tribe, and everyone was out for themselves, you probably could be picked off by a rival tribe. Whereas a rival tribe that had worked together, and okay, we'll go out hunting, and you guys do the farming, and we'll do the job, they survived. If everybody was out for themselves and didn't create these specialties, didn't create cooperation, they ended up dying. Now, Karen Armstrong, who is a great writer, has suggested that at a certain point, which she calls the Axial Age, which was from 900 BC to 200 BC, that the world was getting so violent because of warring tribal factions that the world basically invented religion. And the idea was that violence, political disruption, and religious intolerance dominated the Axial Age, so Axial religions responded 
by exalting compassion, love, and justice over selfishness and hatred. In other words, the idea of the golden rule, which was obviously in the Hebrew Bible, is also in the Buddhist scriptures from that very same period. And the idea is that you need to be look out for your brother. And that was critical. We call this the golden rule, and we see it coming out whenever we have a crisis, like Katrina. People help each other out. When you have a crisis, the natural default position is to go back to helping each other out, to cooperating instead of just looking out for yourself. So this notion that this is baked into our ecology, it's baked into our evolution, is I think strong and compelling that we need to be cooperative. And, you know, we've found that this kind of spiritual element of politics, that is, this notion of the golden rule, has often changed things in really important ways. And I would cite these four examples. The battle over slavery, the battle over child labor, the battle of whether women could vote, and the battle over segregation. In each one of these instances, faith communities have led the way when social scientists and economists said, hey, what's wrong with slavery? It's efficient, right? If you can go capture people and make them work for nothing except just give them some food, that's efficient. See, you see here you get this Adam Smith view and then you get the other view. And the point was that it was the communities of faith saying, wait a minute, there is a morality to this when people say, what's wrong with having a 12-year-old work 12 hours a day in a spinning factory in 1836, spinning cloth? Someone step forward and say, this is basically wrong. This is not the compact we have with each other. Now, I would also argue that this is an Asian notion, this is a Confucian notion, that we need social harmony. And in that sense, the Chinese are a little bit ahead of us. They do not question the notion that social harmony is absolutely critical. And I would argue that we do not have social harmony in our country right now. This is what we get. We have a lot of angry people getting up and yelling at each other, and it's not helpful. Now, how did we get to this place? Well, we got here through a very twisted path. Jefferson puts forth these ideas that all men are created equal, but it is not lost upon us that Jefferson had slaves. So where does he get off that? Now, near the end of his life, he tried to say he was going to give away all his slaves and free them, but he was a man of a very profligate nature, and he got himself into very deep debt near the end of his life. He died, and his heirs said, well, we're going to sell the slaves because that's one of the assets of Monticello. So he didn't keep his word. Now, slavery is very closely tied to the first moves of America away from Washington's ideal that we were not going to be an imperial power. So, as you can see, John Calhoun, all societies, he claimed, are ruled by an elite group who enjoys the fruit of labor of a less privileged group. Here we get back to our democracy versus aristocracy question. And of course, what happened? Why did, for instance, Texas get pulled into the Union? Well, the South needed a certain number of states to keep the U.S. from declaring that slavery was illegal. And because in the Senate, each state, no matter how small it is, gets two votes, 
as more states were added up in the north, as Ohio and Nebraska and all these other states that didn't have slavery came in, the South said, well, we need some more states so we can keep this balance so we don't have this crazy thing of, of the thing outlawing. So they made a deal with Texas. And he said, we'll support you and you go basically take this territory from Mexico because you understand, this was all Mexico. You guys go down there and you take that stuff from Mexico and we'll declare you a state. And so they did. And so we had our first war. So we basically invaded Mexico and we stole Texas from Mexico. And once we did that, then we, we stole New Mexico, California, Nevada, everything else from Mexico at the blink of a gun. So we became our first imperial adventure. Now, I'm going to argue that we need to think about the end of empire. And this is critical. And you know, the way you think about it is empires always end. You know, here's the Romans near the end of the empire. Have you ever seen any of those great HBO shows where everybody's getting very decadent and drinking too much and too much sex and, and it's getting really funky? Well, this is the end of empire, right? Uh, the world gets very decadent and people don't pay attention. So empires always end. The British Empire ended, the Roman Empire ended, and it could be that we are coming to the end of an empire. Now, you may say, well, what do you mean we're an empire? And I'm going to say to you, uh, this quote from Gary Wills, another great historian, says, 68 straight years of war emergency powers from 1941 to 2009, so let's make that 69 straight years, have made the abnormal normal and the constitutional diminishment of the settled order. So we have been in a state of war since the end of World War II, or beginning of World War II. We have been in a constant state of war in this country. And that also allows the central government to spy and listen to your phone calls and do all sorts of things. Now some of this you would have thought would have ended when we saw the fall of that Berlin Wall. You thought, okay, well we don't have a world enemy of a superpower that's opposing us with missiles. But the neoconservatives led by a, a Harvard professor named Samuel Huntington came up with a new theory was it wasn't communism versus capitalism, it was a clash of civilizations. And those civilizations were, needless to say, the crescent of the Muslim Islam world. Yes? Is he counting wars where like, the US has provided aid to like, countries that we need our help, that we're allied with? So, well, that's, that's different. That's, that's more a humanitarian exercise that probably should be run by the United Nations, but it's certainly not our job. In other words, I, I'm going to make the contention in this piece that our job is not to be the world's policeman. Nobody's paying us to do that, and except your parents are paying for it, and you will be too, right? You pay a, a trillion dollars in the last seven years to be the world's policeman. I don't know what you got out of it, but let's, we'll see. What Huntington was saying was, we're, this is a clash of civilizations, and this is what leads to this notion of its Islam versus the West. It leads to nonsense like this thing about the mosque in, you know, 9-11 mosque. And it, you know, it's, it's all has nothing to do with the ideals that the founders started our country with. So, certainly during the Bush era, we felt we were going in the wrong direction, right? This is the right track versus wrong track. 
leading up to the 2008 election. And so when you have those kind of figures, then the party in power, which were the Republicans, get thrown out. And so we had this notion that a president would come in that would change this. We were, we were voting for hope over fear, and that would change. But we didn't count for the fact that there would be a backlash from the 48% who didn't vote for Obama, and they had access to the media in a very big way, whether it's Glenn Beck or Rush Limbaugh, and as WB8 said, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And so we get this kind of weird, strange thing happening in this interregnum. So here we are, and we're still pissed off, right? It hasn't really gotten that much better. It's gotten some better, right? The people thinking that things are getting worse has decreased, and the people who think things are getting better has increased, but it's still more people think things are getting worse than are getting better. The root of this is this, which is what is known as the real unemployment rate. And this is, you know, they tell you the unemployment rate is 10% or 9.6%. The real unemployment rate is 18%. And this is made up of people who are out of work and people who are working part-time who would like to work full-time, as well as people who have just given up completely. Now, even those people who have jobs are not particularly happy. I published a piece on my blog today about alienation, and it's certainly a pretty strong phenomena. And the weird thing is that the percentage of people satisfied with their job in 2009, who are under 25 compared to 2000, 1987 is pretty striking, right? And it's in all the ways, but young people generally, their first job, hey, it's cool, I got a job, right? But they're already pissed off. They're already unsatisfied with their job. Now, for your parents or an older generation, it's much worse. This is the total household debt in the United States, and as you can see, as a percentage of income, you can see it's just gone through the roof. Now, what happened? Well, uh, what happened was, you could see till about 1982, it stayed fairly stable. And then in the 80s, interest rates came down and people began to be able to borrow against their houses. And so everyone took out a second mortgage or a home equity loan, and then their debt went up, 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 up. And of course, now the houses are worth a lot less, and this has become a real problem. But this is not a problem for everyone. And certainly the people that ride around in the private jets, who are bankers, have done really well. And nothing seems to have caught them up. And in fact, when we got, had to have a bailout, a government bailout, who were the ones that got bailed out? It wasn't the homeowners, it was the bankers. We bailed out the banks. So needless to say, people are pretty, pretty pissed off. And, and why did we bail out the banks and not the homeowners? Well, the bankers are spending 2.51 billion in lobbying money in Washington to make sure they get bailed out. In other words, there's a nexus between the government and the corporation that you don't have any control of. And this is making things worse. And even worse is this strange phenomenon. Because we construed the Senate as having two votes for every state, Barbara Boxer represents 18 million people. And this guy, John Barroso, from Wyoming, represents 215,000 people. They both have the same vote. This is weird. 
So what's to be done? Can we still revive this country? And can the tools that we're going to learn about in this course be part of that revival? That is, these digital tools of cooperation. So I have put forth an idea that we have perhaps a notion of new federalism. I first wrote about this in 2007, saying that the California experiment with bottom-up new ideas was very important. And that had to do it at a point when nobody in Washington wanted to deal with, for instance, the fact that cars were way too polluting and California passed a law to require much higher mileage standards. So way back in the 30s, Supreme Court Justice Brandeis said, it is one of the happy incidents of the federal system that a single courageous state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without the risk to the rest of the country. In other words, what Brandeis was saying is America is a very unique thing because it's both a big country and yet it's 50 states. And that we should force experimentation out to the edges and let the states try different things to figure out what works. George Kennan, who was one of the most brilliant minds of the 1950s in terms of forming our doctrines of containment and everything, late in his life wrote that the federal bureaucracy is contributing to the impression of a remoteness and impersonality on the part of the government and of insignificance and helplessness on the part of the individual and thus impairing the very meaning of citizenship. In other words, he's saying the same thing. We've gotten too big and large, complex societies come apart. And so we need to figure this out. So there's this strange new thing that's happening, which has been called liberal-tarianism. And I know that's kind of an awkward term, but basically it's saying liberals and libertarians are coming together. And one of the big signposts of this was an announcement in July by Barney Frank, who's a liberal, and Ron Paul, who's a libertarian, saying, it is irrefutably clear to us that if we do not make substantial cuts in the projected levels of Pentagon spending, we will do substantial damage to our economy and dramatically reduce our quality of life. Now that's a pretty strange coalition between Barney Frank and Ron Paul, but what it indicates is that something is happening in this interregnum, that new coalitions will come about. Now, this idea of devolution, that is, of pushing power to the edge of an organization, is something that every businessman already knows. Ten years ago, you know, Time Warner was an empire of magazines, cable divisions, AOL, Warner Networks and everything. And, you know, its market cap went way, way up and then came way, way down, right? And so what did they do to solve that? They broke up the corporation. They spun off one group, they sold AOL, they spun off the cable group. In other words, they made it smaller. They put it back and put power back into the control of individual man managers. And that was incredibly important. Now, I would suggest that we do not have to worry about the end of empire. I was lucky enough to work with these guys when they were a little older than this, but when I first went to London, in 1964, it was only seven years after the British government had given up its empire. It had surrendered Suez, India had gone back, it had surrendered all of its, empire, its imperial holdings in Africa, 
and London was the center of the cultural universe because they were once again able to think about their own problems, not the problems of ruling 450 million people all over the world. So what I want you to think about is how we reconstruct this new world. And what that means is that we need to think about two different kinds of value systems. One is called situational values. So leaders, companies, or individuals guided by situational values do, ever, do whatever the situation will allow, no matter the wider interest of their communities. A banker who writes a mortgage for someone he knows can't make the payments over time is acting on situational values, saying, I'll be gone when the bill comes due. You all know people who have acted on situational values. I won't be around when this falls apart, you know? So people inspired by sustainable values act just the opposite, saying, I'll never be gone, I'll always be here, therefore I have to behave in ways to sustain my employees, my customers, my friends, my suppliers, my environment, my country, and my future generations. So it's two different ways of looking at the world. And what I'm hoping you will think about is how we build a set of sustainable values. Now we teach them, and hopefully universities are a place where we teach them. And that's part of what we're going to try and do here. So what we want to do now is think about this notion of the end of empire. Every single empire that has ended has confronted four basic problems. One is called imperial overstretch. One is called cultural decline. One is called accelerating inequality. And one is called scientific regression. And what we want to see is, are some of the signs of the end of empire showing up in America? So let's talk about imperial overstretch. So this is the discretionary budget of the United States. As you can see, 56% of the money goes for defense. Uh, how much goes for education? 8%, right? How much goes for natural resources in the environment? 3%. So you can see where our values are. Uh, now, Eisenhower was way out ahead in this. Yeah? I was just curious if you have any idea like, how that compares to other strong people. Yeah, I'm going to show you in just one second, OK? Um, Eisenhower says, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military-industrial complex. The potential of the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Now, Eisenhower was a general before he became president of the United States. And he basically said, you got to look out. Because once the military and the, milit and the industrial companies like Northrop Grumman get together, they're going to use their power to make sure that we keep spending money on weapons. So here's your comparison. Okay, so this is the United States military spending, and this is every other country in the world. Um, so as you can see, we kind of spend a lot more than anybody else by a factor of 10 to 20. Um, we also have another problem, which is because we don't preserve energy, we end up having to fight wars for oil. As Alan Greenspan, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve, said, I'm saddened that it is politically inconvenient to acknowledge what everyone knows. The Iraq war is largely about oil. Because we don't have a lot of oil, we have to get it from somewhere and guess where that oil is. Now. Do we really get oil any cheaper? When you think about old notions of imperialism, like the British Empire, 
So they went to India and they controlled India and they literally just took the tea, right? They took it because it was theirs and they, so they got advantage. But we don't get to take the oil from Iraq. We just pay for oil just the same as the Japanese and the Chinese. We pay the same amount as anybody else. So we get no advantage for our trillion dollars spending in the Mideast. And that's a problem. And the cost of this empire is astonishing. So this is the total debt of the United States. And as you see, once we got into these wars, it got very high. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where was like Social Security and uh, Medicare, Medicaid? Okay, so those, this is what we call the discretionary budget. Okay. This is the stuff that we can make a decision on. The okay. other things are promises to people and they're not in this chart. Okay? okay? Um, so the reason this has gone up is we never decided, like most wars, to raise taxes to pay for the war. In fact, we decided to cut taxes just as we were going to the war radically, and so we decided to borrow the money to go to war. Guess who we borrowed the money from? China. China. Right. Okay, what are the second sign of decline? Accelerating inequality. The basic promise of America was that as productivity rose, so would income. In other words, as workers got more productive, they would do better, right? That's the deal. So something happened. As you can see, median family income began to decline just at the point when the computer revolution took the productivity through the roof. And so there is a basic disconnect between productivity and median family income. Now we can think about all sorts of reasons why this is and we'll, we'll look at them in a sense. But here's the basic problem. People who are in the top 1%, their incomes have gone up 281%. But people who are in the middle fifth, their incomes have gone up 16% since 79. Um, you know, the, the High, even the highest fifth, 95%. But it's the top one percenters that did really well. And, and the top one percenters get 42% of all the wealth. 42, 1% own 42% of all the wealth in America. Now, one of the reasons that productivity number skyrocketed while the median family income kept falling was that we could outsource jobs to poor countries, right? We could move the factory to China. You don't want to make washing machines in Nebraska? We'll make them in China. The problem with that is that it's not just factory workers' jobs that can be outsourced to China. And Alan Blinder, who was the former vice chairman of the Fed, said the total number of current U.S. service jobs that could be susceptible to offshoring is two to three times the number of current manufacturing jobs. So he's saying 50 million more jobs could go offshore. Now what kind of jobs were that? Well, if you've gone to have an x-ray recently, I'll guarantee you that x-ray was not read in Los Angeles. It was sent to India and was read in India and then the radiology report was sent back to your doctor. If you have your taxes done at H&R Block, they're sending those to Ireland or India or all sorts of other places uh, to get done. Uh, so it's not just manufacturing jobs, it's everybody's jobs that is potentially in danger. This, you know, we thought of ourselves as a high-tech economy, right? The one thing we knew how to do was make computers and stuff like that. Well, this is the computer manufacturing jobs in the U.S. It is declining. And this is Foxconn. So Foxconn is a manufacturer in China that makes your iPod. 
And it also makes stuff for Microsoft, it makes stuff for HP and everything. So it has more employees than Apple, Dell, Microsoft, HP, Intel, and Sony combined. One company in China manufacturing all the stuff. Yeah. Is Foxconn the company that went over the summer and something like 12 people committed suicide? Yeah. That's Foxconn. And it, it, it uh, runs basically high-tech sweatshops in China. And everybody uses them. It's, you, you think it's manufactured, your iPod's manufactured by Apple? No, it's manufactured by Foxconn. Now, what has this led to? This has led to a deep amount of overcapacity. So this is the capacity in the United States in various industries. And as you can see, for instance, in the worst case, motor vehicles, we have enough factory capacity that we're only using 40% of it currently. We're only using 40% of the motor vehicle factories that we have online. We're using about 60% of the textile mills we have online. Um, semiconductors, we're using about 55%. So as you can see, we have a, a, a tremendous amount of overcapacity in many industries. And that's partially why the unemployment rate is so bad and partially why prices are falling. Now, we are here to study what we call the knowledge economy. And we have all been told that we don't have to worry about manufacturing anymore, that we'll just be knowledge workers. That's why you're coming to college, right? So you can be knowledge workers. So what is the knowledge economy? Movies and television, obviously. Online video, music, video games, computer software, but it's also things like pharmaceutical patents, right? The patent for Lipitor is a very important piece of knowledge. The patent for Viagra is a very important piece of the knowledge economy. In fact, the worth of the pill is nothing. It's the patent that makes Pfizer's market cap big. So this is the one thing we really do well. In 2007, the US entertainment around the world earned 15 billion in exports, 23% increase over 2006, 50% more than 2003. This industry is one of the few that consistently generates a positive balance of trade. That surplus was 13.6 billion, or 10% of the total US private trade sector. So the one thing we know how to export is software, entertainment, the stuff you guys want to make. And that's a good thing. But there's a problem to this. These are the top 17 software pirates. So 93% of all software used in Armenia and 82% of all software used in China. That means everything from Adobe Photoshop to Microsoft uh, Windows 7, whatever, is stolen. So if, if the vast majority of what you're selling to this part of the world is pirated, that's a problem. It's a problem for movies. So 90% of all movies viewed in China are stolen. 90%. 79% of all movies viewed in Russia are pirated. So we've built this knowledge economy, and yet it does not appear that anybody else gives a damn about our notion of intellectual property. For your generation, this is a problem. Further signs of decline, what we call scientific regression. Okay, so if you go to Louisville, Kentucky, you can be lucky enough to go to the Creation Museum, and there you can see Adam and Eve next to the dinosaurs, and you can be told that the world came about 6,000 years ago, and it all happened instantly, and bango, you know? 
And you can see real facts there that this is all true. Um, this kind of idiocy leads to these kinds of outcomes. These are the top performers in science. And you see where we are? Almost at the bottom. Because people cannot even be allowed to teach science in some places like Texas. Um, so they have to teach creation science. They have to teach myths. Healthcare. We used to be first in the world. Now we're 23rd in infant mentality, 20th in life expectancy for women, 21st for men, and yet we spend 40% more than any other developed country per capita on health care. Something is wrong with this picture. Global warming. This is Russia this summer, and this is, this dark part shows that these parts of Russia have never been so hot ever in the history of science of data. And, and needless to say, the, you can navigate all the way to the North Pole. You can take a boat there now. Uh, you, can, you can go, and I was in Iceland um, this summer. You can see where the glaciers were just 25 years ago. And it's like two miles they have shrunk in 25 years. It's, and of course, the polar bears, they're drowning because their habitat is gone. Now, part of this problem is that we can't understand the notion of natural capital. Things for which nothing could be obtained in exchange, however useful or necessary they may be, are not wealth. So what did Mill talk about? Well, how about water, right? There's water running in the river. How can I make any money off water? Well, <laughs> you know, the head of Suez says, well, it's a very efficient product, would normally be free, but our job is to sell it. So what we have to do is make sure that we capture the natural world and we figure out a way to sell it. That's the way of the world. Now, Partially, when I said we have to fight wars for oil, it's because of this. This is energy efficiency as measured by British thermal units over GDP. As you can see, we are the 28th least efficient country in the world. And any of you been to Europe in the last year? Okay, you notice in Paris how small the cars are and how, how often people take the metro and you know, or you go to Copenhagen and people are riding their bikes and, you know, I mean, everybody else in the world has figured this out. And, and by the way, guess how they figured it out? Gas in Copenhagen costs nine bucks a gallon, right? You figure it out pretty quickly once you have <laughs> gas costing nine. But we can't tax gas because, oh, that would be a tax hike. And we never have tax hikes in America. And so, out of that world, we have an industry in denial. So when sales of the Chevrolet Silverado all of a sudden fall off a cliff and they wonder why when gas spiked, you know, that was the big money maker. We don't make enough money on, on efficient cars. We've got to make big trucks. So, you know, it's kind of stupid. Okay, and the final sign of decline is what I call cultural decline. Uh, market capitalism was designed for an economy without resource frontiers. And it's an open question whether it can be formed to deal with our new finite experiences. So you have on one hand this notion of, hey, we may eventually run out of oil. We better figure out how to get energy going in other ways. And then you have this other problem, which is the problem of Gee, people are really in debt. They don't seem to be going to the mall as much. How are we going to deal with that problem? Because after all, consumer spending is 72% of our economy. And if people don't keep going to the mall, 
we're all going to be screwed. That's the theory. So the way out of that is decided is to make sure that there is advertising everywhere. So you get in the taxi and there's an advertisement. You go to the supermarket and they put advertisements on your eggs. And you lie down on the doctor's bed and there's an advertisement there. And you go through the subway turnstile, there's advertisements there. And that is one potential way to try and get out of it, but will it really work? Um, and of course, the other philosophy, as opposed to this philosophy, hey, we've got a world of limits, is back to our earlier notion, you know, he with the most toys wins. You know, I'm on the bus, Jake, close the door. Now, there's a lot of people left out of this equation. The jobless rate among male black high school dropouts is 72%, 72%. And guess what? In your age range, almost 28% of the homeless are your age. 28% of the homeless people are your age. It's not just old codgers who have schizophrenia, it's young people. And we occasionally see this, right? You know, if you've, anybody ever been to Brazil? Yeah, you've been to Brazil? Okay, so you know that you have high rise buildings right up to, next to what are called favelas. Slums in which people have made their houses out of cardboard and tin and metal and there's no plumbing, there's nothing. So you have the rich right up against the poor. And it's pretty scary. And in France on Friday nights, outside the banlieues, the young Arab kids burn up cars every Friday night, right? And occasionally even in our country, like Katrina, we see all of a sudden like the onion peeled back and, well, wait a minute, what happened? Well, there's all these people who didn't even have enough money to get a bus out of town. They couldn't leave. And so we have to realize that the potential for this revolt is here. Now, this isn't you know, apocalypse in the future, this is apocalypse now. This is the number of deaths per day by gun in the United States, 81. And you know, at age 17 or younger, four people, uh, 18 to 25, 17, 26 to 39, 21, and 40 and over, 30. But guess what? Guess what these ones are? These are suicides. So 25 white men kill themselves a day who are over 40. That tells you something about the alienation. Now, part of this that goes on is we live in a world in this country where there is a giant underground economy that's literally off the books. The FBI estimates it's $650 billion a year. So that's drugs, prostitution, gambling, day laborers who aren't paid on the books, all of that. And you know, we all know the effect of you know, the people taking meth, you know, what happens to them. But this is a fun little chart I found. This is $100 bills as a share of U.S. currency. So who, how many of you are carrying a bunch of hundreds around in your pocket right now? Not, not many of us, right? Uh, but who needs hundreds? Well, if you're a drug dealer, it's a really compact way to get a lot of money together, right? Or if, if you're, you're paying people off the books, if you're a gambler, or, you know, those are the people that carry hundreds. And as you notice how the number of hundreds as a percentage is now up to 70% of all the currency is hundreds. Well, that's for the underground economy. So I mentioned last time Aldous Huxley. If you've never read this book, Brave New World, I really recommend it to you. It was 
written in the 1930s. And, and Huxley said, look, we don't have to worry about the stomping boot of Big Brother. That's not the problem. The world of the future will be a world in which the government will hand out a drug called Soma, and that'll be kind of part Viagra, part Prozac. So you'll feel real chilled out and you'll feel very sexy and uh, <laughs> you won't worry about anything, right? And you'll go to this entertainment experience called the Feelies, you know, and you'll be surrounded by these screens and you'll, it'll just really soak you in. And he said, your basic job in life will be to go shopping. And there will always be a war somewhere. You don't ever know anybody who actually fought in the war, but there will always be a war somewhere where you will go to. Uh, and ma'am, miss, are you going somewhere? What? Okay, sorry. Uh, there will always be a war somewhere. And uh, you don't know anybody who fought in it, but that's the government's excuse for being able to spy on you. So, sound a little familiar, you know? So, people have talked about End of Empire as bread and circuses, right? You remember Nero was fiddling while Rome was burning and bread and circuses. So we, we have our own version of bread and circuses, you know? Uh, this is Bling Bling Barbie. You know, I mean, the, the Barbie is a hooker, and uh, you know, that's what you want to give your little nine-year-old? Okay. You know, and you have singers who can't sing a link who get it famous, and you have presidents who pretend they're fighter jocks, and you know, Donald Trump, one of the worst businessmen in the world, who claims he's the greatest businessman. He's gone bankrupt four times, you know? I mean, so it's all a joke. So, Maybe we have to return to a more reasonable notion of what life is about. And so I'm going to now kind of hopefully paint a, a brighter picture of where we could go. And a lot of it has to do with this notion of the digital economy, devolution, and cooperation. So, the digital revolution is pretty amazing. I talked about open source and I talked about Linux. So Linux is this big free software movement. It took 25,000 man years to build Linux. Not a single penny was spent. Okay, now you think, how's that? Okay, now it's 25,000 man years really means maybe two million people working 50 hours a month or 20 hours a month or something like that, but ultimately a huge amount of free labor worked cooperatively to build this new kind of software and then share it with everybody. So this was an extraordinary cooperative revolution. You have the benefit did you, were you raising your hand or? No. You have the benefit of Wikipedia. Even though I said I don't want you to use Wikipedia as the sole source, I think Wikipedia is an extraordinarily good piece of reference. And think about Wikipedia. If I had told you 10 years ago that I was going to build the world's largest encyclopedia and I was going to build it in 65 languages, and you would probably say, well, well, where are you going to get the $10 billion to do that? Because at the time, you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica was valued at about a billion five, and that was only in one language, and, you know, you would have said that. But Jimmy Wales did it for no money, all volunteer effort, built this extraordinary reference for you to use, and everybody did it cooperatively. People edited other people's stuff. It's amazing. So we have these new tools like the iPad, and we have these things like the Institute for One World Health, which is a nonprofit 
pharmaceutical company, if you can imagine that weird idea. So why did they do this? Well, people in the big pharmaceutical companies do not like making vaccines. Because vaccines, you get one shot and then you don't need it anymore, right? So it's not, a, it's not the kind of like a pill business. Pill businesses pharmaceutical companies like. Because, you know, once you take that Prozac, you got to take it every week. You know, if you take your Adderall, you want it every day. You know, whatever the, it is, that's the kind of business they like. And so they don't like these things. So a bunch of people who are concerned about malaria and river fever and all these diseases said, well, why don't we use this open source model and we'll put our molecules on a server and we'll all work on them, open source. So if you can improve the molecule for this vaccine in Australia from my thing that I put on from Los Angeles, we work together and it's working and they're getting close to having a malaria vaccine. So I showed you this and I, and I said, look, the world of the future is going to be decentralized, networked and bottom up. And I really firmly believe that. Decentralized, networked and bottom up. You guys live in that world. You are decentralized, you are networked and if you believe it, you have the bottom up power. So what would the role of a central government be in that world? Well, the central government really should do three things. It should be the treasury, the money, the Department of State, that is the people that reach out to other countries, and the Department of Defense. Then under it would be all these administrations that try and keep us safe the Food and Drug Administration, which could be a lot better, you know, we don't need eggs that give you salmonella. Or the FCC that makes sure that the internet stays open. Or the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Or the Securities and Exchange Commission that tries to keep people from, like Bernie Madoff from stealing from you. Or the Federal Aviation Administration which tries to keep planes from crashing into each other or the Federal Trade Commission, or the Social Security Commission, or the Environmental Protection Agency. But these, these functions, these regulatory functions, do not need huge bureaucracies behind them. So where am I going with this? I'm returning to a notion of a city-state. You happen to live in one. It's called Los Angeles. There are a few other in the world. And they're so big and so powerful that that's where the money and that's where the change can happen. In other words, my thesis is nothing's going to happen in Washington. We're, everyone gets frustrated by it. We're just going to get into more gridlock from that. And so what we have to do is look to the local area. And as you remember from your history, you know, Athens was a city state. And it was the first democracy. And it acted as in conjunction with other states to deal with other states. And I think Los Angeles has the potential to be that again. So there's a few megacities in the world. You know, so we start Tokyo, Shanghai, Beijing, Jakarta, Calcutta, Mumbai, Karachi, Cairo, Lagos, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, Mexico City, New York, and Los Angeles. Those are the city-states. In those city-states, gigantic amounts of commerce happen, and in those city-states, most of the creative energy in the society happens. Why do people go to cities? Because that's where they want to feel the, the zoom of being in a city. Share of the world living in urbanized areas increased from 40.9% in 1985 to more than 50% today. Globalization and technological change have increased the returns to being smart. Human beings are social species that get smart by hanging around smart people. That's why you're here, right? That's why we come to cities. That's why we come to be with other smart people. 
you know, you could be taking a class from University of Phoenix by yourself online on a computer and never talk to another human being. I think that's a really crappy educational experience. It's the fact that we get in this room and we'll be able to have a dialogue, you know, is, is really critical. So LA County, 10 million citizens, this vast wealth, and if you add it in the four surrounding counties, Orange, Santa Bernardino, Kern, and Ventura, uh, it would be the fourth largest state in the union, just right here. Uh, 20 million citizens. And, and basically, we're lucky because we have all this solar energy here. <laughs> and so, you know, if we thought about it, a lot of what we want to do could be paid for right here. The property in this county is valued at 1.1 trillion. So even if you take this ridiculous Prop 13 thing of only 1%, that's 11 billion in collections, and then there's another 13 billion in sales tax collections, another 15 billion. So you could collect 29 billion in revenue before you even add in the in income tax. And if you were able to keep that money here and spending it on our schools and our roads and our infrastructure and, and improve things, you could have an extraordinarily vital society that could change things quite radically. So I want you to imagine what LA would look like in 2020. And, and this is not just speculation because part of the work that we're gonna do with the lab the Innovation Lab is work with IBM on their Smarter Cities initiative, and we're going to try and think about how we rethink LA, and uh, an LA that would be really energy independent, that would have universal health care, that would have a radically reduced carbon footprint, that would have really good K through 12 schools, and really highly educated public, and that would have everybody participating in citizenship, and by the way, we could reduce our federal taxes as well. So what would we spend the money at if we could keep it? And just so you understand, we have to pay a huge amount of the taxes we collect in LA up to Sacramento, <laughs> because they don't know how to run their budget. So one of the things I do is double teacher salaries. In Korea, the average teacher gets 2.5 times the average income. And in the United States, a basically a high school teacher makes a little bit better than a hamburger flipper. It's really ridiculous. And then we ask why our kids aren't learning, because we're not willing to pay our teachers anything. We'd want to have universal charter schools and we want to make teachers accountable. And, and I must say, one of the things I'm encouraged about the Obama administration is they're actually trying to do some of this stuff. They're actually trying to make teachers accountable. And if you're not good, you should go. You should find some other job. Modern healthcare. One of the problems that you will find when you get into the workforce is that if your health care is tied to your company, it's very hard for you to leave your company. It's like what they call a golden handcuff, because you don't know if you're going to get health care or if you go somewhere else. And, and so we need health care that is not employer-based. And we need to have, there's right now an antitrust exemption for insurance companies so they don't, uh, they, they can kind of conspire with each other to keep prices high, and, and maybe the simplest way to deal with things would be to lower the Medicare age to 50. So, because it's the people that are, that are really losing their job right now are the 50 and older people, and they don't have either health care or anything. I'd like to make voting a lot easier. Uh, in France, you know, 86% of the people vote. And here, even in a presidential election, you know, we're lucky if we get 51% of the week of people voting. So, so what you do is you, you leave the polls open for a week. 
So nobody's got any excuse not to go vote, right? And that seems pretty critical. What? I, I think it's totally true. I think it's totally true. People, people are in a bubble. But you see, this is again goes back to the Huxley idea that you're so, we're, you know, what Neil Postman called amusing ourselves to death. You know, you're so caught up with, oh, what did Lindsay do this week that you don't even think about the political issues that are really right in front of you. And that's important. Yeah. Well, you know, hopefully, I mean, the one reason I, I, I wanted to do this lecture at the beginning was that I, I want to kind of set the stage because, you know, we're going to dive into the real world of entertainment, but I want you to set the stage of how all of these things could be employed as tools to make life better because, you know, we're not here just to entertain ourselves, we're here to actually improve a situation because Quite honestly, for your generation, I'm scared. You know, I mean, I have kids your age, and I'm and I have grandchildren, and I'm I'm scared about their future because I don't think we're paying much attention, and so that's why I wanted to kind of lay out this philosophical groundwork, and we won't talk about politics much from now on, but I want you to at least know. I'll, I'll be honest where I'm coming from you know, that I think a lot of things have to change. But part of it is, you're right, the media has to be more educational and not just what's the horse race, which is the problem right now. So this is part of the solution, universal broadband. One of the problems is that broadband is still a luxury which poor people cannot afford. It's 45 bucks. You know, that's just not. So what do we do with the telephone system? We had what we called universal service. So it doesn't matter how poor you are, you can get a phone for $5 a month because the companies subsidize that, the Verizons and the AT&Ts. In fact, on your bill, your phone bill, you'll see a USF fund tax. And that goes to pay into, everybody pays in, and then th that subsidizes poor people. So why can't we subsidize broadband? And what happens when we do that? This is a woman sitting in her kitchen who works for JetBlue. So when you call JetBlue, you don't get someone in India on the reservation agent, you get someone sitting in their house. JetBlue hires people for four hour shifts to work from home. And they give them a computer, and they give them some training and a script on the screen. And so what? This woman doesn't have to have daycare for her kid. She can work from home. She doesn't have to get in her car and commute to some place and use a lot of gas and spew a lot of pollution. So, Think of the number of jobs we could have if everybody had broadband in their homes and how, uh, how people could telecommute. It's important. Modern nuclear power. I, you know, quite honestly, if we don't think of, the reason I like nuclear power, and I know there's some controversy about it, is that it is, it is no CO2 comes out of a nuclear plant. It is absolutely non-polluting. And France runs 86% of their energy grid on nuclear and have never had an accident. So I think it's important that we stop resisting that and, and I think the left has been really stupid about that and um, you know, that's one of the changes. But more importantly, because we live in Southern California, we have to harness nature. This is a friend of mine, Dave Freeman. He runs the Department of Water and Power. 
I assume all of you have seen the movie Chinatown, right? So the Department of Water and Power, which is the center of that movie, Mulholland, basically captured the Owens Valley. So Dave says to me, John, I'm going to put a five gigawatt solar plant in the Owens Valley. I own the land, thanks to Mr. Mulholland, and nobody can tell me I can't do it. And five gigawatts would not only power all of Los Angeles, but he could sell a gigawatt a day to Las Vegas. Um, we are the world's leader in wind, but we could do a lot more with wind. And there's so much that can be done using these things that we better get started fairly quickly. The other thing that I'd like to devolve is agriculture, right? I mean, I, I don't know if any of you have seen any of these pictures of these chicken barns where all those salmonella eggs came from, but you've got 10 hens in a cage this big. 10 hens, and you've got maybe 150,000 hens in one building. No wonder you're getting sick from eggs. I mean, it's animal cruelty. And, and because we think we have to have these huge factory farms, you, you drive up Route 5 and smell the, the stink of those cattle rendering operations. It's disgusting, and they fill all the animals full of antibiotics in the hope that you won't get sick. Go to your local farmer's market, at least the decent guys. We should have modern transportation. If you go to France, you can go from Paris to Lyon in two hours on a train that goes 220 miles per hour. It's zero pollution because it's electric. Why don't we have that from here to San Francisco? So this is a community of dreamers, Los Angeles. That's what we came here for. That's what we think about. And this journey that we're going to take now for the next 14, 15 weeks is for you to dream big. I want to set the stage for what I think we have to think about from a political point of view. But then now we're going to delve, delve into the world of the artist and how the artist helps us change the situation. Thanks very much. See you on Monday. However, people will have different opinions, so maybe there's uh, the difficulties also exist when they cooperate with each other. It may, but it also may help us cooperate too. Yeah. You know, there are tools for us to cooperate together. You know, you can organize a group on Facebook, or you can organize a demonstration, yeah. or you can use Twitter to yeah. protest. So uh, you're right, it has a downside and an upside. Yeah.